Gardner responds to the EPA's data report, fact sheet on National Data Center of Energy. Oh, Gardner's response to the EPA's data center report was it fell short. It didn't say enough. It didn't begin to start talking about how we needed to mandate the business and how we needed to get better at what we're doing. Right? And so Gartner was actually critical of what the EPA said because they, didn't, they weren't harsh enough about it. A couple months ago, the information, the Data Center Energy Efficient Information Program, DOE and EPA, March 19, 2008, a voluntary national data center energy efficiency information program has begun. It was supposed to close out, the people that were going to participate were supposed to close out one June, but they've actually extended it to one July. If you're interested in being a part of it, you need to look that up, and you can be one of the test centers where you actually gather the information that they're asking for. Engaging numerous industry stakeholders who are developing and employing a variety of tools and informational resources to assist data center operators in their efforts to reduce energy consumption in their facilities. What does that really mean? They're going to do metrics and baseline and benchmarks. And those are going to be the things that they're going to give to Congress and to the Senate, and that's where the laws are going to come from about what is construed to be an energy efficient data center. Right? If you guys remember, a lot of times when the government gets involved in things, they draw the lines, they tell you how you're supposed to build it, they give you an extra time if we think about the emissions and things like that for businesses that were emitting carbons and all that stuff into the air. Right? They were fined by the EPA for not getting their stuff in line. You can imagine what's going to happen with the data centers. We're going to do the same thing. If we don't become energy efficient, and if we don't find ways of doing it, we're going to start finding the big dogs. Right? I can see it coming. These are all the people that are involved. You can see that there's a lot of real heavy hitters up time institute, uh, the 7 by 24 exchange, the ITIC, Silicon Valley Leadership Group, Green Grid Association. A lot of players involved in this that are very interested in what we're going to do. The National Data Center Energy Efficient Information Program integrates and coordinates. You can see what it's doing. Consensus energy metrics and benchmarking, energy saving tools and training. The certification of data center energy efficient experts. Sounds like a government job. Gonna be, when I grow up, I want to be a data center energy efficiency expert. I get to go around and tell you what's wrong with your data center without being efficient. Right? Bureaucracy at its best, though, folks, that's what we do. Recognition of best in class, equipment, performance, specification, and labeling. What they're talking about here is, as you all well know, Energy Star has been huge in the specifications and the labeling of oxygen. We have them all in our houses. We have things that have the little blue star on it, our refrigerators, our dryers, our washers, our toasters, our microwaves. They're all Energy Star approved. Guess what? You're going to be able to walk into your data center one day, there'll be a little blue star on your door that says you Energy Star. Right, because you met all the requirements. Right, that's what we're looking at. Even now, we see servers and hosts and monitors. The monitors really big. Got the EPA, got the, got the blue star. I'm an energy star approved. We're going to see hosts and servers that are, that are going to be the same way. Workstations already are, if I'm not mistaken. There's a lot of workstations out there that are already uh, the energy star approved. Talk about, a little bit talk about facilities. When we're talking about the reading of the IT, one of the things we have to do, and this is really kind of one of those things that you have to think about a little bit, is we have to take three parts of it. We've got to take the energy itself. Um, how are we grading IT? How do we get energy efficient? One of the things we have to do is get cooling efficient. We're spending a lot of money in cooling. Um, there's a whole lot of data centers that are like in uh, places where we store hosts and service where the temperature is 62, 63 degrees. Right, we're chugging a whole lot of water and a whole lot of power to keep that place cool. Right? And today, um, most of your host servers will take temperatures up to 72 to 75. I mean, I will, I will operate at 72 to 75 with no problem. But yet, in our mindset, we said that it has to be, um, if it's not cool enough to hang beef, then we're probably not cool enough in our data center. If the people who work in there don't wear jackets while they're in there, it's not cool enough. And with today's marketplace, the way that machines are built today, servers and, and hosts and stuff, it doesn't have to be that. Right? You can look at the average operating temperature of a new server, a Dell 2950, an IBM, whatever. The average operating temperature says 72 to 75 degrees. That's average. Why are we keeping our data center so cold? Then? There's a mindset for you. Right? Why don't we let them warm up? I see you laughing right there. Right? You know? Why don't we let them warm up? But because, you know, once again, 
Um, when I took over the job, by the way, um, I was a wide area network engineer. I didn't know anything about running data centers, so I didn't know there were sacred cows. When you take over a data center, there's certain things you're not supposed to touch because that's sacred. Does our data center have to be 63 degrees? Imagine the amount of savings you would have if you could cool, if you could warm your data center up. 72, 75. Think about the amount of electricity you'd be saving. Right? Then you could almost be on the same cycle as the building. That's it. 72, 75. If you need to drop it down a little bit, okay, let's keep it at 70. But what a difference that would be. The chilled water temperature could be a lot higher. Your chillers wouldn't run so much. The electricity would drawing. So why is it tied to this old-fashioned way of thinking about things? We need to look at what we're buying and find out what the average mean temperature is that we can run the thing with. Does running it colder make it more efficient? I don't think so. I haven't seen anything that says that. So, what are we doing about the hot aisles and the cold aisles and flexible barriers? What I'm talking about here is everybody knows that in a data center and stuff, right, you're supposed to have hot aisles and cold aisles. Hot air is supposed to be blowing out. You got them back to back. You got them 36 inches in between. You, got, you walk down there, it's really warm in that aisle. It's supposed to be. The other aisle where the front of the box, where it's actually sucking the cool area, that's where the cold air is. So, you got the fronts facing each other, you got the backs facing each other. So, you got the hot aisle. We call it the easy bank oven aisle. Right, because they get really warm, and it's okay that they get really warm. That's an interesting thought, though. I want you to think about that. If you're doing that, if you're doing hot aisle, cold aisle, how warm is it in that hot aisle? 75 degrees? 74 degrees? Because it's really warm. Is that affecting the way that they're running the machines? No. Right? You can put a flexible barrier, you know, those, uh, those soft plastic things that they hang in warehouses to keep the cold air in and the warm air out and stuff like that. You can do the same thing in your data center. You can hang them over your hot aisle so that the hot air stays and you put egg grates up in the ceiling so it goes up to the point and gets sucked out right so that the hot air doesn't mix with the cold air. And if you do that, more efficient. Save the money. Save the money on energy. Okay? So if you do the flexible barriers, cable trays and electrical power. Cable trays. Don't put anything underneath the floor. Now, there'll be a lot of argument about that. Like people go, well, where do you want me to put it? On top. Put it in the hot aisle, too. Move the cable tray over so it's in the hot aisle, not in the cold aisle. Why? Because you don't want anything to impede the flow of cool air. Hot air, you don't care. It's hot air. It's already warm. What are you going to do? Make it hotter? <clears throat> right? Oh, and by the way, those, uh, the, the jackets that are on the copper cables and the fi uh, fiber and all that stuff, they're rated not to get burned until they get into the hundreds of degrees. So, it being 75 degrees in your fiber cable, I don't know that you know the heat's going to affect your fiber cable at 75 degrees. Probably not. Okay, just considering that we run it all over the place. See what I'm getting at? Right? Put your cable trays over under the hot aisle. Keep everything off and under the floor. Put the minimal stuff underneath the floor, right under your raised floor. And uh, put your electric power, if you can, put your electric power up on top too. Keep everything off and under the floor. If you've got raised floor, keep it. The big argument or the big discussion now is do we really need race force? We need to build a data center with race force. Why do we need race force? The way that service and hosts are built today, they get their power or they get their uh, air horizontal. They suck it in and blow it out. Why do we even need race force? Why don't we just change the ambient temperature of the room with the above floor air handlers and do it that way? Do we really need to push cool air underneath the floor? Save yourself money building that data center when you don't have to put a waste for it. Save yourself a lot of money by not having to put flexible barriers and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of things to be asked about that. Racks and cabinets, and I throw that up there, the definition of a rack and cabinet. Everybody knows the difference, right? A rack is the open thing, has no sides, no front, no back. It's just like two posts to put a lot of networking gear in there, uh, a lot of telecom gear, all that things to do all that with the two. A cabinet is something that's four posts, has sides, front, back, and blank, blanking panels. Okay, you need the blanking panels because if you've ever done a study, what happens is, is if you have a hole in your rack, in your cabinet, I'm sorry, if you have a hole, that's where the cool air goes. It doesn't get up to the top where it needs to go. So if you put a blanking panel there, it slides up there and it gets sucked in where it's supposed to go. Right? So it's important to have blanking panels. Right? That's an easy one. 